That beautiful solo that we just heard for our offertory was by Sarah Bonner, who has blessed our church for several years with her music. She left before I could say this, so if somebody in the music ministry will tell her how much we appreciate it. She was here for the earlier service, but I was told not to thank her because she was having a difficult time today. This is her last Sunday with us because she, she and her family are moving. But uh, she has blessed us, so if somebody in the choir sees her a little later, if you will tell how much we appreciate what she has done for us in our music ministry. You know, there's a great deal of danger in thinking we know something and we only know a little about it. It's like trying to go somewhere you think you know the directions or you've been once before, and you can get lost pretty quick, can't you? Thinking you know how to get there, but you don't really know how to get there. Or for you that cook, you know, you think you know the recipe, and on the first bite, you realize you either left something out or put something in that didn't belong there. Uh, it's knowing a little. It's the risk. We think we understand other people and maybe their opinion but we don't understand what's happening in their life or where they're coming from, and we may fail to understand altogether. In our religion, we can have a, a little knowledge, we can have a little acquaintance, we can have a name, a tradition, but not know of the power of God in our life because we're not fully committed, or nor do we ask the questions to be fully understanding. That was, of course, the scene that we had in the first reading today from the book of Acts that David read for us. It was, it was the reading of the unknown God in the midst of the city of Athens. They had all these idols, but just to make sure they had caught everything, they had one for the unknown God, one they might have missed. There obviously was no living faith in an unknown God, but how easy that can be the same for us. I'm reminded of the story of a college professor that gave a final exam in a biology course. He gave six pictures of bird legs on the exam and asked the students to identify what kind of birds they were. The students stood up and said, one and said, this is the dumbest test I've ever seen in my life. And the professor said, young man, what's your name? The young man pulled his trousers up and said, tell me. It's like the woman who spent eight years trying to teach the cat to talk, invested a lot of money in getting trainers to teach the cat to talk. And one day she laid a delicious meal in front of the cat, and about that time the cat yelled, watch out! The woman stood there with her mouth open, not believing what she heard as a ceiling buried her alive. And the cat said, spent eight years and all that money and wouldn't listen when I finally spoke. <laughs> it's like the young monk that was in the chapel and ran in to find the cardinal one day and said, there's a woman in the chapel who has a vision of Jesus coming. What should I do? And the cardinal said, look busy, look busy. <laughs> you know, a danger of knowing a little, but not really knowing. Now, one of maybe the most misleading verses in Scripture was the opening of our Acts reading today. When Paul observed in Athens how religious they were, and then I realized that he was talking about Athens, Greece, not Athens, Georgia. <laughs> but to identify these people that thought they were so religious. If you go back a few verses in that same chapter of Acts and read, the wise philosophers of Athens, the center of learning in the ancient world, was asking questions of Paul. They called him the babbler. They didn't really care what Paul said. They, they, they didn't really want to know anything about this Jesus. They weren't trying to be converted. They wanted to know the novel and the new. They wanted to be able to discuss the latest and then move on to something else tomorrow. And how much of a risk is that in our faith? They could not hear Paul in Athens, the center of learning, but only a few miles down the road in Corinth, a seaport town with every vice known to man, they could hear him. 
and they came to believe in him and to understand him. The importance of us moving in our lives from where God is merely a term to we can sing what a friend we have in Jesus. What it means to abide in God and to let God abide in us. To dwell in such a way that our life is shaped and formed in a new way. I am convinced that evangelism is needed in the church as much, if not more, than out in the community. We are here seeking, but the challenge is, have we found what we're looking for? And we need to continue to let God work with us and shape us, for if we're to be the person God created us to be, we must realize that we're never fully there. And as we dwell in God, and God dwells in us, we can become the person we were created to be. Now, the gospel lesson that Pat read for us is a time to get back to the simple basics in our faith. It, Jesus knew that the curtain was coming down. He knew that ahead was the mockery of a trial, a crucifixion, and yes, a resurrection, but he knew he would not be physically present the same way with the disciples any longer. And he was getting back to the basics of the faith. I'm reminded of a story about Vince Lombardi, that great coach. Vince Lombardi one time, after his last year of coaching, after a humiliating loss, called the team together. Now they practiced and practiced and practiced. But Lombardi looked at that team that day, he reached over and said, we're gonna get back to the basics, gentlemen. And he picked up a football and said, this is a football. One of the players said, coach, you're going too fast. <laughs> now, sometimes we feel, might feel like God is going too fast for us, but the need for us to simply hear, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. You'll be willing to be shaped and formed by the will of God and by what Christ has told us. See, they found a, a new way in Corinth. Read that 13th chapter. It's not in eloquence. It's not in wisdom, it's not in religion, but the more excellent way is love. When you love something, really love something enough to lead where that would lead you, you become a different person. This is a great time of celebration of love in, a, in our, my family and some other families in the church. I read to you where the new incoming senior pastor has a new grandbaby just born. Talked to Dan this week, and I don't think he was touching the ground. This will be his first grandchild to live in the immediate Atlanta area that he can hold and rock all the time as, a, as opposed to the one that lives in New Jersey. And he's just so happy about it. Uh, Keith and Mary Lauder are in Dublin, Ireland this morning celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary. And last night, I got to go to my baby granddaughter's high school graduation. Now, my baby granddaughter is 6'2", but she towers above, the, they call me Bow Wow. They tower, up, but, but that's my last one to graduate from high school. And I'm going to go this Thursday to Iowa for a wedding on Saturday where I will marry my grandson and his bride-to-be. For the first time, I've been a part of a grandchild's wedding. Now, love is what binds us together. And it's the same with the church. The church that we know of, we are sisters and brothers in Christ together. But when you have that love, it begins to change who you are. It shapes and forms us in a different way. Have you ever heard, heard that expression, that's a face only a mother could love? That's the power of love, to shape and form you. Now, if you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. We will seek to live as Christ would have us to live. Jesus never allowed religion to be reduced to a sentiment. He never allowed religion just to become something that can be casual. It was the power of claiming your life and what it can do with your life. I pulled up the other day behind an old pickup truck on Mount Vernon. Now, I love the bumper sticker on that pickup truck. You know, some of the greatest philosophers of the world are in bumper stickers. 
And this one said, don't worry about my truck. My treasure's in heaven. Folks, your treasure is where your heart is. And if you love, it will shape and form who you are and make you the person God created you to be. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, if we keep his commandments, he is faithful to us, and there's a trust relationship that is built, for it demands a commitment from us. Remember the rich young ruler that ran up to Christ on the road? He gave the litany of commandments that he was already keeping and says, what else do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, give all that you have. And we don't even know the name of that rich young ruler as he walked away uncommitted. It could have been another Matthew or Mark or Luke or John or Peter or Paul. We don't know. But until we are willing to trust enough, we will never find out what God needs to do with us. Yesterday was a great anniversary for Methodist. May the 24th, 1738, at about a quarter to nine, John Wesley's heart was strangely warned. Wesley had tried everything he thought in the world to find God in his life. He had been a student and a professor of theology at Oxford. He had been a minister in the Church of England, even serving as his own father's associate. He had been a missionary to a missionary to where we are in the state of Georgia. But he never found what he was seeking until that night when it dawned on him. It wasn't what he did, but what God did for him that allowed him to return that commitment and that trust. And so we must learn to lean upon God or abide in God or to let God shape and form us. Now, if we do this, this chapter in John tells us, God will send a comforter or a sustainer or a spirit or a presence that will live on wherever we are in life. And so the presence we can dwell in will make us the person God has created us to be. Reminded of a New Yorker cartoon where a couple was in a town square and looking around at the various storefronts saw a drugstore with a sign that says, we sell a cure-all, a repair shop that said, quick fix. And the man looked at the little local restaurant and it said, free lunch. He said, you know, I like this place. It gives a lot and doesn't demand much. But in your faith, if you want to find the power and the strength of God in your life, you have to be willing to commit. One of my favorite definitions of faith is faith is like a pair of glasses. For any of us that wear glasses, we know that if you need it for reading or if you need it for distance, it doesn't change the reality of what we're seeing. It focuses the reality. And so faith brings into focus what real life and what real needs are, that we can see them and respond to them the need for us to accept the gift that God wants to give to us. Tomorrow we will pause as a nation to remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice and others that risked to give that sacrifice, that we could sit here this morning and worship and be free, that we can read a free press when we want to and speak out and vote like I hope you did on Tuesday to express your opinion and it's coming again on July the 21st. The opportunity to be free was given to you by people in the words of the hymn we sung that saw country greater than self. And so it is with God, a call for us to see beyond our own limited worlds, to see something greater, to abide in God. There's a story told of a missionary that was looking for a gift to take to a tribe that was way back in the remote part of a country in Africa. Years ago, they had never seen their own reflections except in water, and that was always distorted. So they eagerly grabbed at the mirrors he had brought, and 
and they looked to see what their face looked like, and they were all laughing, and many of them pleased, and, and, until it got to the princess, the daughter of the king of the village. She had always been told she was the most beautiful person in the world. And when she looked at the mirror, she saw that she had not been told the truth. So angrily, I mean angrily, she shattered her mirror and ordered all the other mirrors to be shattered and forbade any time the mirror would ever be brought to that village. Faith can be a challenge. It can bring you to be aware of where you need to grow and you need to change and you need to be different. But the call is clear that if we're willing to trust in God, God will abide in us and give us what we need, that strength. You know, sometimes when I'm really working with a passage of Scripture, I like to read it in other translations. It's hard to move, for example, the New Testament from the Greek to English. You don't always capture its full meaning. And the New Revised Standard Version that we use here in this service, or the common English Bible that we use in the contemporary service, the word is God says, I will not leave you orphaned. That's good news, isn't it? That means our Father will always be there with us and for us and abide in us. I will not leave you orphaned. But if you've ever been to a memorial service or funeral service that I've done, I don't read it that way. I revert to the Revised Standard Version. Just like at Christmas, I only will want the King James Version read. I don't want strips of cloth. I want swaddling clothes. Well, it's the same with this passage. For when the Revised Standard Version, it says, I will not leave you desolate. That's more powerful, I think whether you're dealing with the death of one you loved or dealing with the loss of a job or dealing with a health issue that you thought would never come to your life or the one you love or whether you're struggling with a relationship that is tattered and torn or whatever issue you're living, listen to what God's promise is. I will not leave you desolate. You may have been here a couple of weeks ago for Mother's Day when one of the scriptures was the 23rd Psalm. And it's a promise that even through the valley of the shadow of death, God will go with us. Now, I prefer the King James Version that says that because we all know those words by memory. But listen again to what the Revised Standard Version says. Even through the valley of shadows, not limiting it just to death, but whatever the issue we face, God, will, his staff and rod, will protect us or comfort us or be with us. The power of abiding in God, let us find that in our lives. Shall we pray? Oh, Father, we all face issues we wish we did not face changes and challenges, but give us the grace to know that wherever we go in life, that we can abide in Thee and that You will abide in us. Amen. As we sing our closing hymn, number 402, Lord, I want...